Uh, my name's Fergus McNeil and I'm Professor of Criminology and Social Work at the University of Glasgow where this is being filmed. Um, and it's being filmed for your conference, uh, Conference of Prison and Community Chaplains taking place at the Prison Service College for England and Wales in a few weeks. But hopefully um, this short conversation might be of interest to a few other people so we're going to post it online in one or two places. So Matt uh, from the conference has sent me a list of questions um, which I have in front of me and we're going to try and make it conversational rather than over prepared. And Matt's first question is, how did I get into this field of research and what interests me about it? The field of research in question is desistance from crime. How and why do people stop offending and move on in their lives? And I guess the origins of my interests in those sorts of questions date right back to my first degree, which was in history and philosophy, also at this university in Glasgow, um, where I studied processes of change and development, perhaps at the social level rather than the personal level. But straight after that, I went into residential drug rehabilitation, um, I should probably say as a worker rather than as a, as a resident. And I spent three years living and working alongside people who were trying to recover from serious and significant um, drug problems or alcohol problems. Um, and that experience led me into a career in social work initially. So I came back again to Glasgow University, um, studied social work in the early 1990s, and at that time um, became more and more interested in the criminal justice system, both because of the obvious challenges that people faced in um, submitting to sanctions, going to court, being placed under supervision, trying to avoid offending behaviour, um, and because uh, the system interested me as a system which communicated something about the kind of society that we are and the kind of values that we have. Um, so I qualified as a social worker, uh, worked in criminal justice in the east end of Glasgow for five years uh, when it was my job to be a supporter, I guess, of desistance processes, trying to work with people um, under supervision uh, to address their difficulties, to move on in their lives, to progress towards social integration um, and I guess also compliance with the law. Um, and when I left that job in 1998 to become a full-time academic, teaching firstly social work students, then criminology students, now sociology students, um, I took the same set of interests with me into the academic role. Um, in other words, what do we do in the criminal justice system? What are the effects of what we do in the criminal justice system? What impact do we have? Um, and more specifically, um, do we do any good? Um, do the interventions that criminal justice practitioners deliver make a difference either in the lives of the individuals that they're working with or of the communities uh, with which they're engaged? Um, and four or five years into my academic career, I stumbled um, across a body of research about desistance from crime. At that time, not particularly well known or well used in criminal justice contexts. And I saw in it um, lots of resonances with my experiences as a practitioner, um, lots of echoes of the issues and challenges that people I had been working with had faced, um, and lots of opportunities to reframe the way that we think about criminal justice policy and practice in new ways uh, and hopefully better ways. So that's how I got into desistance research, and that was question one. Question two um, from Matt, what role can mentoring play in desistance from crime? First of all, um, most desistance researchers now understand that desistance is explained best by looking at the interplay between three sets of factors. So people get older and they become more mature and there are physical and physiological, psychological changes associated with ageing. But, and this is the second strand of theories, those changes are also social in character. So people are differently connected or bonded to social institutions at different points in the life course. Their relationships with work or employment, sorry, work, employment, marriage, training, um, civil society more broadly, those relationships shift um, over the course of one's life and that affects your behaviour, your um, associations. Um, and this is the third strand, also affects your identity. So how do you see yourself how do you label yourself? 
how are you labelled by others and with what consequences and effects. So these three sets of factors, age and maturation, social ties and individual identities or narratives interconnect to influence the extent to which individuals are involved with offending behaviour, move away from offending behaviour and move into social integration. So when, when I think about desistance now, um, I think about it in three main ways. Um, in the literature, people talk about primary and secondary desistance. So primary desistance is behavioural. Secondary desistance is about um, labelling an identity. So to be seen as an offender, to be seen as a desister. Um, and the third strand for me is about belonging. I might call this tertiary desistance. So to whom am I affiliated? What set of social relationships matters most to me? How does that interconnect with and influence and affect my sense of identity and my behaviour. And so if you apply all of that to mentoring briefly, you can see that in a, in a good and a positive mentoring relationship, and think about this outside the context of criminal justice or even outside the context of formal mentoring, think about the way that any of us might have been mentored by parents, by peers, uh, by uh, extended family members, by social associations, by people involved with youth organisations over the course of our life. These mentors and role models have the capacity to influence our behaviour, um, but also in a perhaps deeper way to shape our sense of who we are and who we want to become. So in one desistance theory, um, one of the key aspects of desistance is about being able to identify a replacement self. In other words, a way of being you, which is authentic and true to your life experience, but doesn't involve offending anymore. And you can see how a mentor of, a, of uh, a certain sort might help an individual imagine a replacement self, uh, a more positive way of being who they are, uh, while still being authentic to uh, where they're from, what matters to them, and how they see themselves. So uh, you can see that mentoring could influence behaviour through affecting the way that we uh, construct our identities. But you can also see that mentoring might affect our sense of belonging. So back to my tertiary desistance, uh, mentoring can affect our social networks, our social relationships, our sense of being socially supported. To, to borrow another bit of jargon, mentoring might help us develop bridging social capital or connections into new opportunities through different networks that mentoring enables us to activate. So lots of potential connections but a lot depends on the quality and character of the mentoring and in fact a lot depends on the quality and character of the mentor in question. Which takes me to question three. What factors should we be tracking to show whether we are supporting people towards desistance? Well again I think this question comes out of a concern that the way in which we currently measure desistance um, and indeed the way in which we tend to think about the success of criminal justice intervention is far too narrow. So the current preoccupation of the U UK government linked to uh, transforming rehabilitation and the, the idea of payment by results is reconviction rates. And um, criminologists of course are highly sceptical of the value of reconviction rates, at least um, if we expect them to measure change in individuals and change in individuals commitment to compliance with the law or to social integration. The obvious problem is that conviction is a social process. So to become convicted, a crime has to be observed, uh, reported, um, acted upon by the police, um, detected, the, the offender has to be detected, uh, a case has to be presented to the prosecuting authorities who have to present a case to the court which has to reach a decision about guilt before determining whether or not or, or what sentence to pass. So there are so many breaks in the, pro in the criminal justice process between behaviour and conviction that measuring the success of criminal justice by conviction looks um, risky or problematic. But there's another reason why um, reducing reconviction is not an adequate measure of progression towards desistance and this is linked to the points I made earlier about identity and belonging. So neither of these is captured by reconviction. Reconviction measures behaviour, well I've just said it, it measures behaviour in a very blunt way but let's just say for the sake of argument it measures imperfectly behaviour. 
But I've also said that resistance is about identity and belonging. And whether or not somebody's convicted tells us very little about those two facets. Why should we care about them? Well, I think um, the, the strongest likelihood of securing long-term desistance from offending, moving away permanently and completely from offending behaviour, is going to be associated with the kinds of shift in identity and in belonging that secondary and tertiary desistance um, encourages us to think about. So we therefore need to develop measures which get at shifts in identity and shifts in belonging to society or integration with society. And those, those measures may be in some respects harder to grasp or harder to operationalise. Um, norms at the National Offender Management Service for England and Wales has begun to recognise the significance of what they call intermediate outcomes on the road to resistance. I would almost put it the other way around and say that the behavioural change is intermediate the identity change and the change in terms of belonging is more long term and more secure um, and ultimately it's enabling those kinds of change that give us the best prospect of diminishing offending and promoting a safer society both for the person who has offended and for the uh, others in the community. So I think we need to get at something that helps us to track shift in identity and belonging and not just shifts in behaviour. The next question is connected. Can I think of ways of tracking what would be helpful to the individual journey towards desistance? Again, there are lots of possibilities here. In um, social work research, people write sometimes about single case evaluation, so about trying to identify measures of progress that are bespoke to the individual in question that connect to um, the individual's particular issues and challenges and to their particular strengths and resources. And in this kind of model of evaluation, at the individual level, you develop a theory of change, which in simple terms is an answer to the question, why do I think that doing what I propose to do to support this individual will bring about the results that I am after? That, that question elicits a rationale or a theory of change. The next challenge is to work out how to capture metrics, quantitative or qualitative data that enable you to assess the adequacy of that theory of change. So in some services, um, people will be familiar with things like the outcome star as one such mechanism where you can uh, identify the points of the star or of a flower or of any other diagram that you choose to use. And you can help the individual collaboratively to rate where they stand on a specific dimension. And you can chart progression away from the negative pole towards the positive pole on any number of these different um, points of the star, as it were. Um, you can also think about maybe um, journaling um, or diary keeping um, in ways which help people to collect not just the raw data, but reflective information or reflective accounts of the extent to which they feel themselves moving on. Um, changing, progressing, shifting in identity, shifting in sense of social connection. You could measure quality of life. Um, you could measure um, the development of a person's social capital and uh, social connections, social networks. So there's a range of different possibilities there. Um, and then lastly, the final question, the fifth question, what changes could we make to be more focused on promoting desistance? I take structural here to mean probably criminal justice structures, although of course we can't look at criminal justice structures in isolation from other structures in society. So for example, as you will be aware, many of you will be aware from your work, changes to the welfare system, changes to the housing provision in a given community, changes in the education system, changes in the health service, changes in access or lack of access to mental health services, all of these associated or related structures will either facilitate or impede um, a journey towards desistance. So it's not, desistance is not in the gift of criminal justice agencies working alone. Uh, it depends on connectivity with other sectors that can provide important supporting functions. I'll give you an interesting international e example here. In Norway, they have something called the Reintegration Guarantee, which is a kind of established principle 
I'm not sure that it is a legal duty, but it's an established principle that public authorities in a whole range of services have an obligation to play their part in the reintegration of returning prisoners. And that um, guarantee helps ex-prisoners to secure access to the kinds of social resources that they need in order to support their resettlement and help them move away from offending. Now, I think many of us would argue that in the context of the UK jurisdictions, we have nothing approaching a reintegration guarantee. We may not be quite as far along the line towards the other pole, perhaps America or some of the states in America would represent that opposite pole, where the extent of what they call felon disenfranchisement is so grave that some commentators describe the fate of released prisoners in America as a kind of civil death. So there is, uh, uh, there are limitations on voting rights, which um, famously may have been one of the de determining factors in the Bush versus Gore uh, 2004, I think it was, election in Florida felon disenfranchisement of principally African-American voters uh, could have been one of the factors that swung that election in uh, Bush's favour. But it's not just in disenfranchisement in relation to voting, it's disenfranchisement in relation to public assistance, public housing, access to the labour market, um, access to particular social places and spaces. So all of these forms of disengagement, um, disenfranchisement, alienation remove people from the capacity to develop the sense of belonging which is critical to desistance and you end up with the absurdity for example in Florida of camps of sex offenders living under bridges on the freeway because they are so excluded from uh, residences in proximity to schools for example that there's literally nowhere for them to live other than on the road, literally, and that's not the road from crime or the road to desistance. So um, the structural changes that we might need to make extend beyond criminal justice. But if, if we think about this just in the context of rehabilitation, the way that I've described it in some recent papers uh, is to suggest that there are four forms of rehabilitation that we need to simultaneously pursue. So the first of those is very familiar, and we've done a lot of this in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And I've called that um, in different places personal or psychological rehabilitation. So we have programmes and we have interventions, the function of which is to develop the skills, the capacities, the attributes and the motivation of the individual to change. And um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that work, in my view. Uh, it's important that people are equipped with thinking skills. It's important that attitudes are challenged um, and that people have the capacity to develop their sense of what their personal values are or should be. But personal rehabilitation or psychological rehabilitation in itself is an insufficient basis for social reintegration. So I can transform myself as much as I like, but if I leave prison or uh, if I walk out of a probation office into a set of social obstacles to my integration which are so um, egregious as to uh, delimit the possibility of inclusion, then um, I'm stuck. And, and in fact, I'm, I'm worse than stuck. I'm likely to be frustrated, alienated and angry because the effort that I've put in has not been recognised in my social environment or social context. So the second kind of rehabilitation, social rehabilitation, speaks to informal delabeling in the community and in the society at large of people who have left offending behind or are trying to, and a willingness on the part of the community uh, to wrap those people back in, to graft them back into the social body, um, to work uh, to build their social connection rather than to marginalise them. But social rehabilitation depends on moral rehabilitation too. And this is where um, another set of difficulties arise. So I may have paid my duty to the state through punishment. Um, I may have served my prison sentence. But if the community doesn't accept that my debt is settled, then the community's willingness to embrace me or even just to tolerate me on my return from this formal state-sanctioned punishment will be diminished. So 
mediation might be required, a kind of moral mediation between the so-called offender and the community might be a necessary part of enabling rehabilitation to happen. But there's a flip side of, of moral rehabilitation too, and that is that both the state and the community owe something to the returning prisoner for two reasons. One reason is that the state and the community are probably most likely complicit in the conditions that gave rise to the offending in the first place. And if you look at the social backgrounds um, and profiles and personal histories of people in the criminal justice system, Social Exclusion Unit report of 2002 makes this abundantly clear. They are among the most disenfranchised, marginalised, disadvantaged, brutalised and abused people in society. So there's a debt that they are owed, uh, which is a historical debt um, from the state and the community to them. But even if you want to dismiss that as a left-leaning um, or cuddly liberal um, making of excuses for offenders, there is, conveniently, a more right-leaning reason why we also need to recognise a duty to ex-prisoners and ex-offenders. And that is that on a strictly retributivist principle, we need to ensure, we have a duty to ensure that punishment ends when punishment has been served. And yet uh, the sociological evidence is that punishment continues long after the formal sanction is supposed to have concluded. So um, if you look at work in America on prisonization or even secondary prisonization of families, the way in which the consequences of the sanction reverberate through the lives, not just of the prisoner, but of those associated with them, then uh, a case can be made that the state and the community are failing in their duties to delimit punishment to that which was legally ordered and imposed. So for both of those reasons, I think, uh, moral rehabilitation cuts both ways and that there are duties from state and community to the offender too. So we've got three forms, which leaves one. And the last one is judicial or legal rehabilitation. Um, and this is closer to the concept of formal disenfranchisement, although I don't have voting rights necessarily uppermost in my mind here. Uh, I'm thinking more about criminal records. So if we have a system in which people who have offended and been convicted are more or less permanently stigmatised in relation to job seeking, then um, we're asking them to achieve reintegration with at least one of their hands tied behind their back. So uh, a key means of integration is labour market participation. And we, uh, again, collude with or permit a system which um, makes labour market participation much harder. And we don't do that on the basis of any credible scientific evidence about risk. The evidence about risk is, and uh, this is a, a, a broad generalisation, but one which has the authority of Professor John Laub, formerly of Harvard, and uh, also uh, a former director of the National Institute for Justice in the Obama administration. Uh, Professor Laub argues that having a criminal record ceases to be predictive of reoffending after three to five years without an offence. So the spent period, if you like, for any criminal record really should be very short. Um, if it's risk, which is uh, making us cautious about whether or not we employ people with a criminal record. Um, and then there are other ways that we might reform uh, the, the, the system, occupational disqualification, for example, which is more specifically tied to offences. But the broader principle is that if we don't let people back, if we don't legally certify that they are uh, rehabilitated um, and therefore entitled to participation in the labour market and in society, if we don't restore their full citizenship, then um, we are hamstringing their capacity for integration. So the simple point would be the structural change here that I would advocate is that we need Whenever we think about rehabilitation in the criminal justice system, we need to hold in focus four forms of rehabilitation. Personal rehabilitation, social rehabilitation, moral rehabilitation, and judicial rehabilitation or legal rehabilitation. And if we can develop strategies that interweave those four strands, then the prospects of securing um, long-term reintegration and with it, um, desistance from crime and compliance with the law are going to be much encouraged. So, um, 
those are some of the structural changes that I would encourage if we want to get more serious about supporting resistance. Thank you for listening. <laughs>